Again, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar where we will talk about um, res stock. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, so we are recording this webinar and we will share it out with participants and registrants afterwards. Um, as we go through the webinar, if you have any questions, um, please drop those in the Q&A and we'll have a chance to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and yeah, as you're joining, feel free to drop your name and where you're from in the chat. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Glory now from NREL, who's going to talk a little bit about NREL and what we do. Thank you, Yulia. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. And welcome to the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Blog Grant Webinar Series. My name is Glorine Rojeda Matos. I am a researcher and technical assistant provider at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL. NREL is one of the 17 U.S. Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. And our primary focus is on the research and development of renewable energy and energy efficiency. We also provide technical assistance, data and tools, and research in both technical development as well as the social science application on how communities may adopt these technologies. Collaborating with state, local and tribal entities, NREL aids to implement, of, implement the research findings and tools. Today's webinar uh, will focus on restock modeling tool, an analysis tool that can help states, municipality, utilities to identify how uh, housing improvement save the most money and energy. So you would like to learn more about NREL and our initiatives, feel free to explore our website at nrl.gov and connect with us on social media. I will also like to mention regarding the ECCBG program, NREL is supporting the DOE Office of State and Community Energy Programs by providing technical assistance for the energy efficiency and conservation strategy portion of the EECBG formula funding application. At NREL, we can provide you up to 20 hours of free technical assistance um, to develop or review your EECS strategy document. With that, I will hand it back to Julia to continue guiding us through this webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, all right. And so I am going to hand it over now to Alex from SCEP, who's going to talk a little bit about SCEP and uh, what they do. Thanks so much, Julia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today to talk about ResStock. Um, I'm just going to share my screen briefly um, so that we can walk through some program updates and reminders from the ECBG team. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, yeah, so looks good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so let's get into some program reminders from the ECBG team. So first, we have a few upcoming deadlines that we wanted to remind you all about. The first is for our Community Energy Fellowship. Um, this fellowship is to provide you all with capacity to help you implement your ECBG projects. Um, so if you're interested in, in getting a fellow to help you um, implement whether uh, your project, whether that be, you know, a, a solar project or a building efficiency project or whatever that may be, um, the deadline to apply for that is March 5th, um, which is coming up quite soon. Another deadline that I'm sure you're all aware about is um, the actual deadline to submit your EECBG program application, and that deadline is April 30th, um, so about just under two months away um, from that deadline. In addition to our deadlines, we have a few additional exciting upcoming events. Um, if you're here today, you might already know that February, our theme for our events was buildings and building efficiency. Um, so for March, our theme is going to be tax credits and elective pay. And we're planning on hosting two webinars in March that kind of dive into these topic areas. The first on March 14th 
um, which will be an introduction to kind of what these clean energy credits are um, and how you can take advantage of elective pay. And then the second will be a, a training uh, in collaboration with NREL on March 19th. Um, that'll dive a bit more into how we can finance some of the upfront capital um, and generate revenue from um, projects that might use clean energy credits um, as well. Um, that session will dive a little bit more into some use cases um, to get into kind of the nitty gritty details of that. So th those will be really two really exciting events and I can put the links um, to register for those in the chat once I'm done sharing. Another exciting event is um, DOE's Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit. Um, the ECBG team is gonna be hosting a technical assistance workshop on April 2nd um, at, at this summit in Washington, DC. Um, so if you're already planning on attending or considering attending, um, this will be a great, a great session for, for all ECBG eligible entities. Um, there's also some limited travel assistance that might be available for public sector attendees. So definitely um, check out the registration link to learn more about that. Um, a few other opportunities that I'll, I'll run through really quickly is just um, our energy savings performance contracting campaign. Um, this campaign helps you um, get technical assistance to um, expand or enhance uh, energy savings performance contracting programs at the local level. Another opportunity that's coming this summer is an energy efficiency finance foundations training run through Berkeley Lab, um, and that's really targeted to public sector um, staff, uh, like many of you are. So I encourage you to, to, to check that out as well. I also wanted to mention that um, pre-filing registration is available for clean energy credits through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so if you join us for our webinar on March 14th, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I've included the link here just in case you want to explore in your own time. And then lastly, um, we have an, there's an event that um, the state and community state office of state and community energy programs is hosting on March 21st that's specific to codes enforcement in rural communities. So I just wanted to highlight that as an opportunity for those who might be um, in rural areas and interested in potentially implementing um, new and updated codes. Um, and with that, those, that's all the updates I have for, for everyone today. Um, I'll be on on this session for the next hour or so. So um, feel free to drop questions in the chat and, and, and we'll all answer them and I can help answer the ECBG specific questions. Back to you, Julia. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, I see one quick question in the chat and yes, we will send the slides after the webinar or the recording. Great. So I'll just get set up to present and go ahead and introduce our presenters today. Uh, so Jess joined NREL in 2020. Currently, we're working to develop the future buildings workforce and helping communities pursue their decarbonization goals through technical assistance. And then we also have Bill White. Bill is a research engineer in the residential building solutions and scaling and has been with NREL for two and a half years, public data sets. Awesome. So thanks to you guys so much for being here today. To you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Julia said, my name is Jess Brossman, and I'm a researcher here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL. Phil, would you like to come on and say hello, too? Yeah, hey everybody, I'm Phil White, and like uh, Julia said, I've been with NREL for two and a half years, and I am one of the main users of ResStock to publish our public data sets. Thank you, Phil. Also, thank you to the whole EECBG team for having us here today. We're really excited to tell you a little bit about um, this really neat tool that can tell you about your residential buildings. I'd also like to say that I originally come from Maryland, and I saw that two of our active chat participants are from Maryland, and so I know that there are so many families and groups of people who will benefit from you being on the webinar today and learning and applying for this grant, so thank you for being here. Here we go. So before we get started about talking about Redstock and this tool, I think it's really important to help set the scene and to understand what everybody is interested in today. So 
I wanted us to spend a few minutes, maybe just one minute, kind of brainstorming some questions or maybe why you joined the webinar today about breast stock. So please take some time to put your um, comments or questions in the chat. And then in a few slides, we'll come back to this and we uh, will have a short discussion verbally or in the chat about some of the questions. So as an example, perhaps you're interested in what the most popular type of housing is in your region, or maybe something even more specific, like specifically how much money people could save by installing more insulation and different weatherization measures uh, in their homes. So I'm going to go quiet for maybe about 15 seconds. So everybody feel free to brainstorm maybe on your, and if you have a notepad with you, or if you'd like to just put your questions in the chat. Okay, that's been um, uh, about 15 seconds now, but again, please continue to do that and we'll come back and we'll talk about those in a few slides. So now that we've set the scene and we have some of our questions in mind, let's start by talking about what RedStop can show you. In general, um, we have a few different categories of information that our tool can tell you. The first is about hair housing characteristics or some descriptions of, of your housing. We can look at things such as heating fuel, wall insulation level, energy consumption, and even if a home or a dwelling unit is renter or owner occupied. Outside of housing characteristics, we also can look at different things related to energy, such as energy bill savings in breaking that down even to a more granular level, such as energy savings by fuel type, emission savings, and energy burden. We can also look at different energy efficiency measures or results of applying energy efficiency to some of the housing characteristics that we talked about. Today, we'll be talking about things such as heat pumps, installation, ducts, and more. So all of this information is available at different um, levels of granularity. So today we'll actually be going over a state example, and then we'll be going over by uh, city as well. However, you can break it up by housing type, income level, and many other characteristics. So we have a background of uh, what Restock can show you. Let's tell you a little bit about what the tool actually is. So it's actually a statistical model that uses over a half a million samples to represent the housing stock. It's a building energy modeling tool, and our goal is to help show you the energy consumption of the housing in the US. In general, it's a combination of three things. Um, the database or some of the data that we talked about, physics-based computer modeling, and a little magic that we like to call high-performance computing. So a little bit about our workflow. First, we try and describe the housing stock quantitatively with all of the data that we've collected. Then, because there are more than a half million homes in the US, we take a sample. Then we model all these samples and we look at different changes and what those results look like after we apply to all of our samples. Then finally, we publish all of, all of our results. So these include details about the sample, some results, and some different visualizations and some documentation as well. We'll go over a lot of this during our webinar today. While you, this may be the first time today that you have learned about RESTOC, it's actually involved in two other tools that I believe you've received guidance on as part of this EECBG webinar series. So for example, RESTOC is a big input to SLOPE, the state and local energy state and local planning for energy tool that I believe you have learned about. And then also the lead tool, we have similar data sets and inputs as a lead tool. So you might already be using RESTOC and just not know it yet. Now that we've gone over a few high level details about RESTOC, I wanna show you a bit more of a granular detail here. So RESTOC, we can show you more than a hundred characteristics about your home and we collect this data from um, very popular and well-respected data sources, such as the U.S. Energy Information Administration, or U.S. EIA, and U.S. Census data. We can help show you probabilities of different characteristics in your home. So, for example, looking at this slide, we can see that 8% of homes are in the Mid-Atlantic region, 11% of them were built in the 1980s, and then there are about 54% of them have gas as their heating fuel. We can get even more into the details and tell you about the furnace efficiency or even such as your wall insulation or number of panes in your windows. It's a really powerful resource. Okay, 
We've gone over a little bit about Redstock, and now that you know about some of the characteristics that we look at, I'd be curious if some of your, if you think some of your questions and use cases will be answered by this tool. So if you'd like to come off mute and share verbally, otherwise I know Phil is actively monitoring the chat. So um, please put your questions in there, any comments that you have. Would anyone like to come off of mute and share their brainstorming questions or use cases? I have a question. Uh, this is Lupita Montoya. I am a fellow embedded in Harris County, Texas. And my question, I, I mentioned that my big interest is to find the most beneficial improvements in housing of disadvantaged communities. Sure. Some part of the uh, effort to create and implement a climate justice action plan for the county. Mm -hmm. And um, my question has to do with uh, the uh, the data sets themselves. I was playing with the uh, restock last night and I looked at the data being, you know, like um, somewhat uh, outdated. And I'm wondering what the next update will be. So eight, uh, 2018 in my book is a little bit on the older side, but I will imagine these are very challenging data sets to update. So I'm wondering if there's one in the works uh, and also what are the, uh, I think some evaluations as of how confident you are in certain numbers. I also noticed those numbers, which um, I'm an engineer. So I, those are the questions that an engineer should be asking. And yes. so I'm wondering uh, if whether we're looking at some update sometime soon. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Lupita. And thank you for your, your very clear, um, you prepared for the webinar today. So I appreciate you being so involved. Um, as you pointed out, many a lot of our data does come from 2018, and as you pointed out, um, it is difficult to update and make sure we have reliable information for all of the housing resources that we are looking at. Um, so a lot of this depends on when um, the Energy Information Administration and census data is updated. So that um, what we have right now is currently the most up to date. Um, I will say that uh, this calendar year alone, we have at least two new releases coming out, new data sets with newer sources. And so um, we won't cover those um, data sources or data sets today. However, a lot of the um, documentation and examples we will go through, you should also be able to run in these new data sets. And then in terms of how we make sure that this information is correct, that's another great question. I really appreciate that one. We actually went through a three-year project called the End Use Load Profiles EULP project, where we spent three years um, making sure that our data actually matched real life data in a variety of regions around the US. So Phil, if you could put the End Use Load Profiles report in the chat, please, that would be very helpful. I can Thank do that. Thank okay. Thank you, Lupita. I hope that helped to start to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to make sure we cover at least one other attendee. Would anybody else, one more person, like to come off of mute and share some of their brainstorming questions or use cases? Yeah, oh, come on. Um, I think Lapita asked a lot of great questions. Um, oh, Adam, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, maybe that's wow. just me. Can you hear me? It's very no. soft. Can you? No. It's a little better, yes. OK. Sorry about that. Uh, I think Lapita asked a lot of great questions. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you guys have verified your, your modeling data. Um, and I'm working with the city of Las Cruces down in New Mexico uh, for their LMI um, energy efficiency program. And um, I just think it's great that you guys have basically you've gone out and done audits, essentially. Um, and now we can kind of filter and decipher through all this data without going out and doing a, another energy audit, essentially. Um, at least I'm hoping this, this data is granular enough to do that where you can kind of filter out different types of buildings, you know, by age, the construction and whatnot, um, what equipment they have, and then kind of go from there on a high level um, on, on developing um, kind of like a LMI energy efficiency you know, um, plan. So I just, that's all I wanted to really share. Um, what, what, um, I guess what software do you guys use or modeling software? Is Redstock itself, does it do the modeling itself? It's just kind of behind the scenes that we don't see. 
Good um, question. As a user, on the user end, I guess. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So um, I do want to say you mentioned that this was essentially an audit. And I do want to say that this is just a data set so okay. that we collect from other data sources. So it's not like our team went out and did energy audits mm -hmm. ourselves. In fact, sure. we often say that Redstock is a good starting place to help set the tone for an energy audit for things that you might look for in a region. So I just want to be really clear about that. Sure, no, that's in great. Terms, um, in terms of what... Um, Modeling tools we actually use to get the rest stock information and feel, um, feel free to come on and um, give some more information, but we use um, Open Studio and Energy Plus as our main energy modeling tools. Okay, which is great. Oh, yeah, uh, you know, nice Open Studio and Energy Plus, I figured you guys might be using it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so just to expand a little bit on that. So you can think of rest stock as a tool that creates building models that can go into Open Studio and Energy Plus. So, so Redstock, you know, draws on these um, publicly available data sets like um, the Residential Energy Consumption Survey by the EIA, American Housing Survey, American Community Survey, lots of census-based um, data, and creates essentially distributions to sample from um, for geographies that are on the Puma resolved level, like geographic level. And so Redstock's magic is trying to statistically represent what those data sources are telling us. And once it does, it puts it in the format for Open Studio and Energy Plus to then do the physics-based modeling. And we'll use weather files. Um, the weather files we use can be historical or typical. Um, the one of the data sets we'll look at at the end of this webinar really uses both 2012 and 2018 historical weather files and then a typical meteorological year. Um, so this is kind of getting in the weeds, um, but essentially Redstock does build on Energy Plus and Open Studio to do the actual physics modeling, the, the thermodynamics of heat transfer. Sure. And Re Redstock's magic is is really getting translating these data sources into dwelling models that are representative of, of the United States. Okay. Yeah, thank you both. Um, maybe in the future, I might ask to expand on how you get those data sets in to actually into Open Studio and whatnot. So um, I guess on my end, I could manipulate it further if I wanted for specialty item or whatnot, but, but thanks again. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. And um, at the end of the presentation, we'll go over our um, team's contact information. And so that would be the best place um, for you to reach out to us. And we can always set up a, a further call. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you to everybody for being so interactive. This is really fabulous. Um, I think now just for the sake of the presentation and demonstrations, we'll, we'll keep moving along. Okay. Um, so you've heard uh, I think Lupita asked about like how representative is the data set? How do we make sure that it's good? And so we like to use this example of uh, the puppies here on the screen. So on the left-hand side, you can see a very high resolution puppy. It's very cute, right? And you can see every single detail about the puppy. In order for Redstock to be that representative, we would have to know details about every single building, all of the characteristics. And so um, what we do instead to make sure that our results are usable and that they can actually run quickly is we create a, rep a statistical representation like you heard Phil say. So with our statistical representation, we get this picture on the right. So you can still tell it's a puppy, it's got two eyes, two ears, a cute nose, and it's great for high level information, but not all specific information such as how many whiskers it might have. So it's not perfect, but it does allow us to make very informed um, decisions and conclusions. We've gone over a few details about the tool now, and I want to go through an example of how a uh, city actually used some of the rest stock analysis that, and that we helped them with. So I want to go over our partnership that we had with the city of Chicago. Chicago was very interested in putting together a city scale analysis to help inform um, some of their electrification plans, which sounds like that's really similar to a lot of people on the call here today. So interesting thing about Chicago is that they actually have 40% of their homes were built before 1942, which is before a lot of modern building energy codes were actually created. So it's a really unique challenge. 
uh, ResDoc, we used to help model the gas and electricity use. And we were also able to analyze energy bill savings based on different utility rates. Through our analysis, we found that heat pumps were actually a great opportunity to save um, many families and dwelling units money. In addition, heat pumps can also help meet the heating load in the winter and then help meet the cooling load in the summer. After the conclusion of this project, the Chicago team said that they feel a lot more confident talking to people about heat pumps and some of the savings that they might see were they to go through um, this kind of home retrofit. That's just one example. So while I've been talking about Redstock and we've been really open about where a lot of our sources and data come from, Redstock is a model, just like many of the other tools out there. So I think it is important that we go over some of the limitations here. I've listed them here. You will also have the slides at the end of the webinar, so I recommend you read these after, but we won't be going through each of these one by one. Should you have more questions after our webinar today, I would recommend you first stop by our website, resdoc.nrel.gov, which is where you can find documentation, including the three-year validation project that we talked about. You can also provide or see information on our metadata and much um, more granular details on our measures. I also want to say if you're ready to get started with using the rest stock data, we have a great YouTube training series, which you can see here. Um, we go over our um, data visualiz. We have I think multiple data visualization demonstrations. We have state dashboard training, and we even have some specific videos on how you might apply custom utility rates, change the weights of the building samples and more. So I do recommend you check this out if you're ready to get going. So we've been talking about Restock, which focuses on residential buildings. However, I also wanted to point out that we have a sister tool called Comstock which you guessed it, focuses on commercial buildings. So it's very similar. A lot of the assumptions and data sources that we talked about today is very similar. So I also wanna point you to Comstock. You can see the website at the bottom here, comstock.nrel.gov would be a great place if you wanna find out more information um, for your planning about commercial buildings. Here's an example of how one city was able to use Comstock information. So, for example, Comstock was used to help uh, a city in Georgia called Unincorporated Norcross. There were over 10 million square feet of aging commercial buildings zoned for industrial and business activities in the area. NREL, um, us, a regional efficiency organization called SIA, and community groups across Norcross, community groups across Norcross, identified project goals. They wanted to evaluate um, different energy usage patterns in the area, what were the biggest, biggest end uses of energy, and what measures and strategies they should target in order to upgrade the commercial buildings in their area. They wanted to focus on a really specific area, so we helped them identify a small data set that they could use. After the analysis, um, it was found out that actually not many of the buildings had gone through any roofing changes over the course of the building's lifetime, and that only a few had made systematic changes to their heating, ventilation, air conditioning, or HVAC units. These were two big outcomes of the project, and it helped to inform a lot of community decisions. Now, with these results in their hands, Unincorporated Norcross has been able to apply and win other technical assistance opportunities to focus on a deeper analysis and implementation. Okay, now we're about to head into the demonstration portion of our webinar today. We'll be going through two examples. The first is um, what we in short call the state dashboard. The full name is the state level residential building stock and energy efficiency and electrification package analysis dashboard. We'll be going through a multi-step program, uh, problem, excuse me. Well, we'll be talking about how much money um, could be saved through a heat pump. We'll also um, quickly look at energy bill and carbon savings. But as you know, um, not all homes can just have a heat pump. Some need a mini split heat pump due to the availability of ductwork in the home. So we'll look at that as well. This information is at the state level. State level is helpful to start with because it gives you an understanding of the housing situation in your state and can help you come up with more detailed questions. So after we've gone through a state level example to help set the tone, we'll then be going through what we call our data viewer, which is how you can find out more granular information. Uh, the data viewer, we can um, 
has results such as different annual results, time series results, and energy consumption by dwelling in it. Today, we'll just be going over some annual results. And should you have more questions after our um, demonstration today, you can email our team at resdoc at nrel.gov. You can also find our email on our website as well. So I recommend you um, check out both of these resources if you'd like a further consultation with our team. Now I'm going to stop sharing my slide and we will get started on the demonstration portion. At this point, while I'm loading this up, you all should have received a user or a tool guide. If you could please pull it up and follow along with me, I'll be trying to get verbal cues so we can walk through it together. I will say that on the state dashboard, the text is kind of small, might be hard to follow along with, but if you follow along in the, in the tool guide, you'll be able to see the results much more clearly. So let's go ahead and get started. If we look at our tool guide, which I also have pulled up, the first thing that we need to do and what I recommend for all starting places is going to the RESTOP website. So we'll go to, I already have it preloaded because I go to it all the time. However, you would type in reststock.nl.gov. You can see our beautiful website right here. And if we go to the um, second step in this, we're going to head and click the data sets option, which is the first left one here. I'll go ahead and click data sets. Then you're brought to a page which has information on our data sets and links to different sources that we have. For this first example, we said we would be going at the state dashboard or the state um, energy efficiency and electrification dashboard. So I'm going to click this blue rectangular button here, and this should load in a new tab. Okay, and I will say that this state dashboard has a lot of data. So if it takes a while to load on your end, that's very normal. This is the homepage for the state dashboard. You can see that we have a brief description of our tool. We also have a summary map of the contiguous US on the left. And then on the right, you can see um, smaller black tabs of information. And this is where you could click if you wanted to be linked to a certain tab or to find out more specific information on a certain topic. So again, uh, our question for this tool is how much energy could a certain state, state save by implementing heat pumps? What about the energy bills and emission savings? And then finally, the third part of this question, how many homes would need a mini split heat pump because they don't have duct work? So to get started, we're first gonna think about um, what kind of heating and cooling systems people already have. So first, we're going to click on the cooling system box. It's about halfway through on the right-hand side of the black tabs. So I'm going ahead and click on cooling system. You can see it's nicely loaded for me. If we go to the third step of your tool guide, you can see that today we'll be focusing on Florida. So if I hit the state filter button on the right, I will scroll down to Florida or FL. In our example today, we'll just be going over um, the whole state of Florida. However, if you look on the right, you can see other filters such as climate zone, area median income, and vintage, or when the home was built. So now that we have loaded the results for Florida, you can see we have two types of information shown on this page. At the top, we have five pie charts showing the percentage of homes or dwelling units that have a certain cooling system. On the bottom, you can see we have an actual data table showing the um, number of homes that this represents. So in our case, for example, if we're looking at Florida in single family detached homes, which is the first pie chart on the left, we can see that um, about 55% of homes have a central air conditioning system, for example. So this is how you might read this pie chart. And that represents approximately 2.7 million homes. So that's a great way of how you can use a pie chart and also the data table on the bottom. So now that we've gone over what percentage of homes have a certain kind of cooling system, we wanna look at a more granular level to see what kind of savings people would see at the individual dwelling unit or home level. So now if we head to uh, step five in the tool guide, we can see that we're going to click on the dwelling unit savings percent tab. This will show us savings by percent. If you were interested in actual values for the results, you could click on the dwelling unit savings dash total tab. 
So now I'm going to click on the dwelling unit savings percent tab. Okay, so now that we've loaded this, we are interested in using the same state of Florida, for example, for continuity. So in this state, I will click on that filter. I will unclick all states and instead just click on FL for Florida. Okay, we can see that that's loaded nicely. Another filter that we're gonna apply for this is looking at only the energy efficiency and electrification upgrades um, that specifically call it heat pumps. And so the first filter on this, um, you can see and you can see if you follow along on your own site as well, we have 16 different packages, but today we're only interested in the ones that call it heat pumps specifically. So I will go and uncheck the packages that do not specifically call it heat pumps. So please be patient with me while this loads on my end. Okay. Okay, we'll just give that a second to load. Okay, so now we have filtered to the state of Florida with three specific measures that call it heat pumps in particular. You should be right now on step nine in your tool guide. So what we can see here is that Florida, we have the three heat pump measures listed there. And then you can see we have a bunch of different information such as um, percentage of energy bill savings, we have that broken down even by fuel type. So if you're interested on um, people who had fuel oil, for example, what percentage of savings they would see, you can see that here as well. We also have this broken down by um, percent of emissions and um, energy savings percentages as well. In this specific um, result, you can see that um, for Florida in the first line, which is a minimum efficiency heat pump with using the existing homes heating as backup, we can see that people on average would save about 6%. Now, it's interesting when we hovered over the cell, we had a pop-up box. So this shows us a more, uh, a wider range. The values that we just present here are the averages. And so if you hover over the cell, you can see the fifth to the 95th percentile of savings here. So we went over that the minimum efficiency heat pump would see people would say about 6% bill savings on average. Whereas if we went with a high efficiency heat pump and if the home had electric backup already in the home, they would see an average about 24% savings. So that's just one example. Now, but we wanna figure out how many homes would actually need a mini split heat pump due to ducting. So let's go to the HVAC ducts tab. You can either do that by going back to the home screen or you can click on the HVAC ducts up top. So I'm going ahead to click on that tab. And again, we're still using the state of Florida as our example. So I'm going to head to filter to Florida at L. And we can see that um, for single family detached homes, about 8% of homes do not have any duct work. And so they might be good candidates for a municipal heat pump. So at this point, um, I believe we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I would like to go ahead and go to our um, next um, demonstration, which will focus more at the city level. Julia, is that an okay plan or would you rather take a pause? Um, I think we can pause to answer questions if there are any. Sure. Um, Phil, are there any in the chat that we should answer about the state dashboard? I haven't seen any, um, but I've been answering some other questions that people had about what data rest stock include and confidence intervals and things like that. Okay. Um, feel free to keep the questions coming and I'll, I'll try to answer them as they come in. Okay, thanks Phil, I appreciate your help. Does anybody have a specific question about the state dashboard? Or maybe um, would you like to see the same example with your own state? We can go through that as well quickly. Feel free to come off of mute and um, verbalize them. Nicole has a question. Are, are the rates updated each year? Are the utility rates? Yes. Yes. So. 
In Redstop, we, um, for this data set in particular, we pull our utility rates from the, I think it's called the URDB utility rates database, and maybe Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but those are um, average utility rates across the state. And so I would have to read more specifically and see the last time that those were updated. Yeah, and our and our update our upcoming releases, um, which should be in the next quarter at least, um, include EIA utility data, and we tried to get the most recent EIA utility data for that. And I think the most recent they have um, is twenty twenty one for electricity and for fossil fuels, it was something like 2020, I think. Um, and in our upcoming releases, similar to what we have released so far, we'll have uh, documentation um, and at least a technical report for one of them that will go through how we calculate the utility rates in great detail. Yeah, thanks for providing more clarification, Phil. I would say if someone was interested in running their own custom utility rates to check out our YouTube series, where we actually have a video on how to do that. Yeah, and 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 generally we we say if you think you have you know your area better than we do. Um, so our utility rates are based on state, and maybe you have some kind of localized effect that means your utility rates are much different. Um, so I would encourage. Or, you know, our, our standard answer is we encourage our users to use their own utility rates um, if, they, if they have good ones. Um, if not, we, we use uh, state averaged uh, rates from the Energy Information Administration. And similar to the answer that we gave Lupita uh, earlier, um, we try to update the data when it's released and its release schedule is not you know, it's not like a marching band. <laughs> um, it's 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 a little bit more striated. So um, we try to update it when we can. Yeah, thank you, Phil, and thanks, Nathan, for helping with that question. Hearing no other questions specifically about the state dashboard, I'd like to head into the second part of our demonstration. So, if you look at your uh, tool guide, you can see we are now in the accessing the data viewer tool section. So. Let's go ahead and get started on this example. <clears throat> As usual, we're going to start at the Redstock website. So I'll go back to the homepage just so we can walk through this together. So if you're on the web um, Redstock website, you will go ahead and again, click on the data sets tab, which is the leftmost one. I'll click on data sets. And then um, you can see we have a very nice uh, table here, which describes our publication date, um, what year of the buildings we represent and so forth. However, I wanna call your attention to the fourth column, which is called data viewer links, you know, annual and or time series data. So for this case, we're going to hit um, by state, which is in this fourth column here. So I'm gonna click this and it will bring you um, to a login page. So this is where we, in order to access the data, you have to make a free page. It's free, easy to sign up. So for this example, I will just use my login information so we can walk through this example together, although you will need your own login to access this on your side. Okay, so for this example, we are going to be asking the question, how much annual energy can the housing stock in Denver, Colorado saved if all of the eligible housing units upgraded to the basic enclosure? And we'll go through all of this, what this means. So the first thing we have to do is type in a location. This is the leftmost box here. So I'm going to type in Colorado and for NREL is located in the state of Colorado. And so this is a handy example for us. So you can see here that we have pulled up, um, pulled up the state of Colorado. If we scroll down here, we have three options of data that we can explore. The first one are bar charts, which explain the difference between the baseline housing stock and if you apply an upgrade, what the housing stock would look like after that, some of the different energy results. You can also see in the middle that we have time series data. So if you're interested in looking at an upgrade and how that might change your overall load profile, could look at the time series data. And then the third option is a histogram option where you can see the average energy consumption in about um, 
how many homes or dwelling units in each one of those categories. For example, today we'll be looking at the bar chart information. So I'm going to go ahead and click explore bar charts here on the left. Okay. The first thing that we want to do is filter because as we said, we wanted to look at Denver, Colorado today. So I'm going to click on the add filters button. You can see we have a pop up here and there's a number of things we could filter by city, Puma, even county. For this example, we'll be using city. So I'm going ahead to click city. And then a filter option with all of our available cities will pop up. I will scroll down to Colorado, Denver. Luckily, it's not at the end of the alphabet. So here we go, Denver, Colorado. So you can see that it's been applied in the upper left. You can see added filters. We now have Denver, Colorado as the added city. I'll go ahead and click Save Filters. So now that we've gotten that added, we're going to choose our upgrade that we want to look at. So in this case, we will be um, choosing the basic enclosure. So if I click on the upgrade in the middle and choose basic enclosure, which is the first option, I'll go ahead and choose that. And then we're okay with the output, which is energy consumption. Now, one thing that's really important to point out, we see this kind of orange box over here on the right that says the results are out of date. You have to click to make sure that the results you're seeing on these histograms are up to date. So I'm going to click on that now. And that should be step six of your user guide if you're following along. So now we can see that the histograms actually look different, which is good. That tells us our results have been implemented. And we can see the legend up here on the top. It's color coded by a number of end uses of energy. And we see on the left hand side that um, total energy consumption of all of the dwelling units in our baseline comparison um, with the dwelling units that have had the basic enclosure applied. So that's what the histogram is showing on the left. And then the chart on the right is showing how much energy is saved by each end use. So for this example, we'll be looking at um, natural gas heating. So when you can find that, I'm just going to click my mouse and I'm just going to hover over natural gas heating, which is in the middle of the legend here. And you can see that that isolates some of the data on the charts. On the left, in the baseline scenario, you can see that natural gas heating um, was approximately 3.66 uh, terawatt hours of energy. However, after the basic enclosure has been applied, it is now about 2.38 terawatt hours. What this means is that on the right, you can see that we have a total savings of 1.28 terawatt hours. So you can um, do this for any kind of end use that you can see here. We just use natural gas heating as a, for our example. Now, you've heard me talking about the basic enclosure, but we don't know what that is. And so where would you go to find more information about what the basic enclosure or any of our other upgrades show? We will go back to our homepage, go to data sets up top, and we can go to, um, and click on the technical documentation, which you can see here, the third box. And this will pull up a PDF where you can see what's included in the basic enclosure and any of the other packages that we detail. So that was our example um, for the data viewer at the city level of Denver, Colorado. Would anybody like to walk through an example of their city that they're in? Feel free to come off of mute and we can walk through an example together. There's a question in the chat from Adam. Uh, he asks, uh, you use the word eligible for dwelling units when applying yes. the upgrade measures. What does eligible dwelling units mean in this case? Yes, great question. Thank you, Nathan, for helping with that. So eligibility. So for example, um, if a home already has um, a minimum efficiency heat pump, it cannot be upgraded or cannot be eligible to get another heat pump, for example. And so therefore that upgrade is not applied to that house. So when we talk about eligibility, we talk about the homes that um, don't meet the minimum requirements for the, for the upgrade package. And so then they, that package is then applied to the dwelling units that can actually be upgraded to that certain level. So for example, um, basic enclosure is kind of a minimum envelope package. 
And so not as many homes would be eligible to upgrade their envelope um, relative to those that are maybe a high performance envelope. They're really high insula insulation levels, um, low infiltration rates, for example. So it depends on the baseline characteristics of the home, if it can actually be upgraded or not. So that's uh, details eligibility a little bit more. Thanks. Is that kind of like, uh, I was looking at the, the metadata for baseline. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little sick. Um, and also <clears throat> the upgrades like one through 10 or 16. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a applicability um, yeah. table in there. And is that what it's applying to? It, it just be like, this upgrade isn't applicable because it's already been applied or it already meets that, that minimum standard. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's Thank a great question. Much. Yeah, we don't want to just apply the measure to all homes because that's not true. That's not what you would actually do in real life. And so, um, yes, good question. Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. Okay, would anybody like to walk through an example of the data viewer for their city or county? If, if we don't have anybody, that's totally fine. I think that was the end of our demonstration. And so then we could head into the Q&A portion of the, for the rest of the webinar time. So if you have a specific scenario I'd like to run through, let's do that now. Otherwise we'll head into the Q&A. Somebody volunteered Aurora, Illinois. Uh, okay. <laughs> in the chat. Yeah, let's give it a shot. So. Um, we're back at our homepage. So here we'll type in Illinois. Um, uh, the Illinois, okay, Illinois representative, um, would you like to pick a package that you're interested in? Are you partial to maybe an envelope measure or heat pump? Or maybe we have a teammate who's really fond of heat pump water heaters. Do any of these call out to you specifically? Uh, envelope measure is what you put in the chat. Okay, awesome. Let's look at our enhanced enclosure, which is kind of our upgraded envelope package. Or heat pumps, sorry. Envelope or heat pumps there were the two sheets. <laughs> okay. Actually, um, so we can look at this at the, can look at this at the state level. So you can see we've just done Illinois up here. However, if we want to specifically, you said it was uh, Aurora, Illinois, was that true? Yes. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and explore our bar charts. It's funny because there's also an Aurora, Colorado, Colorado. So that's good to know. Um, okay, we're going to add our filter, city, Illinois. You're hitting me with the middle of the alphabet. Okay, go ahead and choose Aurora, Illinois. Okay, and what do we have to do? Click the orange button because our results are now out of date. So if we go ahead and choose that. We now see the difference in um, annual energy consumption for the baseline. So all of the um, dwelling units and then only those homes that are applicable or eligible to have their envelope upgraded to our enhanced enclosure, you can see the results on the right. So similar to our last example, it looks like the largest end use of energy that's been saved is natural gas heating. So if we highlight over that, you can see that originally there was about 1.6 terawatt hours of energy um, used by natural gas heating. And then after this has been applied, there's now 1.13 terawatt hours of energy, which is about a 460 gigawatt hours savings. So thank you for volunteering uh, to have your city displayed here. Okay, now I'm going to stop sharing our screen and we can head into the Q&A portion of our, um, for the rest of our time here today. I think we have about uh, 30 minutes left. So that leaves us about probably 20, 25 minutes of questions or any scenarios that people might like to walk through. I have a question or scenario. I'm sorry that I, I have to jump at three. Um, if to um, determine, so would you recommend this tool to basically analyze um, the ability to target different investments for different upgrades in the housing stock in your in your municipality? Um, and you can basically project 
um, at a high level estimate what the what those different upgrades would would achieve in terms of energy efficiency? Yes, at a high level, like you pointed out, I think that's a great use case. You look at energy bill savings, emission savings, and then total energy savings. Those are three examples that you might have your tool to look at. I guess it, it, it might not help, though, in terms of getting a baseline understanding of what the actual stock looks like in your particular area. Oh, it's, you can do that, um, particularly at the state level. Um, so we went through the state level demonstration. Um, if you were interested in getting some information about your housing stock in your local area, you should check out our YouTube, which is where we talk through how you might um, find out more specific information about the housing characteristics um, at a smaller level. Awesome. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got a couple more in the chat. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if this is addressed. It says, what if our exact city isn't listed in the filter? And I said like Tonopah, Nevada. Yeah, so um, that's probably because uh, Tonopah, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, it's probably a smaller city. Um, we have a threshold, I think it's a Puma designation. Uh, whether it's a city or not. Um, in that case, I would focus on um, your town's Puma. Um, our building char characteristics are based off Puma. Um, so we can't get more resolved than Puma right now for housing characteristics. Um, you could also use your county. I know Nevada's counties are quite large. Um, so they might encompass more, more cities and have, have more um, dwelling models in that area. Um, thanks, Philip. I just wanted to chime in because I asked that question. It, is there an easy explainer somehow on how to how to get that county level data that you mentioned? Yes. Uh, yeah, Jess, go ahead. Yeah. Do you want to run through it together? That would be awesome. OK, I was going to say kind of already volunteered, so let's do it together. OK, so we're going to head back. Um, we'll just use the data viewer because that's what we were just using. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again. And um, Greg, you said you were from Nevada. Is that true? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Do you guys say Nevada or Nevada? Nevada. Nevada. Okay. Some people say Colorado differently, so I always think it's kind of fun. But let's go ahead and explore our bar charts and then filter. And then you said you wanted to look at county. Is that true? Um, yes. Okay. And oh, okay. So this brings up a fun question. Phil and I were just going over this the other day. You need to know, um, I believe this is your county and your Puma identifier together. Phil, would you like to add to this? Yeah. So this is, I believe it's called a GIS joint um, number. It's kind of in the weeds, but essentially it's your Puma number. Uh, plus your FIPS number. FIPS is a identifier for county state. Um, so you would look up your home Puma um, and then it should also have your county's FIPS on there. So where is Tonopah? It looks like that's an interesting question. You're kind of in the middle of the uh, Great Basin there. Um, Let's see. Thanks for asking this, Greg. This is a great way for us to go through this as well. Yeah, so I usually try to bring up a map of uh, a Puma map of Nevada. And from what I can tell, I think, I assume it's rural Nevada because it's not in Reno or Clark County. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty rural. And thank you for, for going through this. Yeah, of course. I believe it's 00300. Is that an option on there? And then. You said 
Zero. I'll, I'll type it in chat. Okay. <laughs> so we're trouble following that. Um, the Zoom chat. Already selected Nevada, or do we need? Yes. Okay, so they all start with. Okay. Uh, there's a few options, so don't be dismayed. Okay. Okay. Let's see if you put it in the chat. I'm about to. Okay. I've got a lot of pots in fire today. Zero, zero. Okay, so that's the Puma code. Um, yep. And tips. Looking that up now. The fun exercise. Okay, so the zero zero three zero zero will be the final five uh -huh. um, on the code, and then I believe so. The FIPS code for Nevada is three two, so it should start with three G three two, and then end with zero zero three zero zero. I uh. Okay, so I have a zero zero three one zero, or I have a zero 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 three zero. <laughs> that one. So I think, Greg, for demonstration purposes today, we might just pick the three two zero zero three one zero. Yeah. I'm laughing because it's hard to go through examples live, but let's go ahead and use this as an example. So again, we have oh. Greg, what option are you interested in? Envelopes, heat pumps, or maybe a combination? Let's do heat pump water heaters. Oh, heat pump water heaters. A big water heater fan over here. Okay, fabulous. Okay, so we're going to click our orange button. And you can actually see it disappears. So if um, you still see the orange button, you still have to update it. So <laughs> looking at our example together for a uh, similar Puma, we can see that the biggest end use um, of energy is kind of this light green color, which um, is natural gas. So you can see that if you upgrade to a heat pump water heater, surprise, all the natural gas goes away. And you can see that's about um, 577 gigawatt hours of energy that have been saved. Awesome, you guys rock. Thank you so much for walking through that. Definitely yeah, sure, Greg. Sorry we couldn't uh, find your exact Puma. Um, but no, it, it looks a like demonstration. Phil, Phil put it in the chat. So I think it was one of those in the list. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna go look, go down the rabbit hole, make sure that's the one you want, but yeah. Yeah, and um, Phil, it looks like we had somebody ask, it's the FIPS code followed by the Puma code, right? Yeah. That should help people. Okay. I'm going to stop. Yeah, sharing. and we we had a question about the nomenclature, and we actually have a dictionary of oh. of all our like you know how do you what does this mean this G number 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 um, it's on our the same site that Jess is using to look at the data. Um, do you want to pull up? Yeah, go to data sets. You'll see under supplemental data and dictionaries, um, you can download the data dictionary, which tells you what does the column mean, um, column or value like, like county. And then the enumeration dictionary says all possible values for that column. Open it in Excel. You might have to right click and say open with Excel because they're tab separated value files. Um, and that will give you um the nomenclature for things like this and for puma and it'll tell you what we mean by geometry building height and it'll tell you what we mean by wall insulation or construction or things like that um there's an evaporative cooling question which is exciting um there's this yeah is, i can i can just yes. again um yeah i was 
I, I just did the, the filter for Las Cruces, New Mexico. New Mexico, I mean, even Southern Colorado. Dry climates have evaporative cooling. And I was just looking at the savings um, and um, like electric cooling wasn't, you know, negligible in savings. But then I see the, the cooling for fans and pumps was substantial. So my, I guess my question was, or I, I saw there's a savings in cooling electricity, but evaporative coolers are, you know, pretty efficient, a lot more efficient than DX. Um, I just wanted to know if you were modeling evaporative coolers in your, in the res stock program. Um, it looks like you might, when I look at the fan, the fan energy saved, but so that, that was kind of my question. And I know that the data set might have some that already have, you know, traditional single stage DX cooling, and then some houses might have evaporative coolers also. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think we do not model adaptive cooling like outright. They're probably single stage DX that are a lower efficiency, a lower efficiency but I'm going to double check um, with one of our developers. Um, so I can get you, wait, we do, we do model adaptive. I believe. Okay. I'm looking at it now. Um, Where are you seeing this, Bill? If someone wanted to I, find the information, I, I'm looking at the TSV of housing characteristics, and I can. I'll basically post what I'm looking at. Okay. Um, and this this is also in the weeds, and this is also kind of a question that Adam asked before: is how do we how do we get the samples of buildings that are then turned into a, a model to go into Energy Studio, Energy Plus and Open Studio. Um, and I'm gonna post that into the chat. This is from our GitHub repository, which is publicly accessible, and this is where Redstock lives. Um, this, is a this is a folder full of tab separated value files that show the probabilities of us sampling something based on its dependencies. So um, an example of this would be like, say we wanted to, to sample a house that's in Phoenix. Phoenix has a newer building stock. So it's probabilities that you would get a newer vintage home um, than an old one uh, is more likely. So that distribution probably skews to our vintage is broken down into decades, probably skews to the 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Whereas if we wanted to sample a place like Boston, which has a lot of old builds, um, that probability distribution would probably be 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. There's also other things that will depend on what you sampled for vintage. So wall construction, probably a lot of masonry before 1940s probably a lot of wood stud when you have ranch homes in the 50s and 60s. Those are all intertwined with how we, we sample these. So what I posted is each um, TSV file will show the dependencies that whatever its titled name is, has, and probability distributions. Now, like I said, this probably isn't applicable for a lot of you who just wanna look at data and make decisions um, to help your community. Um, but if you're really interested and want to deep dive into how we get our data and how we sample our homes, um, this is the place for you. So in here, I clicked on HVAC cooling efficiency. And you'll see that on the first column, there's a dependency on cooling type. And one of those dependencies is evaporative or swamp cooler. Um, so that's how I know we at least mark that the evaporative or swamp cooling cooler is there. Whether we model it differently than a single stage DX is a really good question, Adam. And I'm going to get back to you on that because I'm also curious um, about that. And Adam, if you would um, maybe either my message us privately or put your email in the chat so we can follow up about that, that'd be helpful. And, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I will. Yeah. 
And while Phil's looking into that, I see we have another question about if there's a way to combine multiple upgrades and see the savings results, for example, like in, um, advanced enclosure measures with high efficiency heat pumps. So I, um, this is a great question. I appreciate um, bringing this up. If we, I'm going to head and start sharing my screen. Um, so the short answer is yes you can look at different combinations. So for example, if we click, this is under the rest stock website under data sets. So for this example, we'll just click on the technical documentation, which will pull up a PDF. And you can see, um, well, let me just see if I can make this bigger. Okay, so you can see that we have um, descriptions of each one of our measure packages. And you can see like, for example, um, measure packages seven through 10 are combinations. So whole home electrification is the combination of multiple electric appliances like electric cooking um, and others. Um, you can also see we even specifically will call out like high efficiency whole home electric electrification in combination with the basic enclosure package, for example. So um, I would say we recommend only using the combinations that we have already studied in depth or modeled. We do not recommend adding the savings from different measure packages to create your own. And that's because there are different um, thermal energy and other interdependencies between different technologies. And so if we haven't modeled them together, the results could be different. So um, I would just stick to the combinations that we have already model together to make sure that you're getting an accurate answer. And I just put the link for our, um, it, in this example, the tech, technical documentation in the chat so you can see what combinations we have available right now. You've also heard Phil mention that we are gonna have two, at least two releases this year. So right now, while we only have a few combinations, we will be coming out with uh, tens of combinations in the future. Lupita. Assuming predetermined upgrade combinations have been validated extensively. Yes, they go through the same validation process as their other measures as well. Thank you for the question. I appreciate uh, you making sure our data is sound. We also like to make sure it's sound. So yes, we do a lot of validation. Okay, were there... Um, any other questions? Um, we, I think we have about, about 10 minutes left for Q&A. Any other scenarios that people would like to run through? We can try and determine another FIPS Puma on the fly, make Phil work today. Um, or we, I'll just be quiet for a minute and see if anybody would like to come off of mute and ask a question. How about if you do something for Houston? Houston? Oh, I thought I, I, I thought I, I thought I said enter and I didn't. <laughs> so, okay, we can do um, Houston. All right, and why don't you just stay off the mute and we'll walk through what example you'd like to see. So again, we'll be using the data viewer because we can look at a city that way. So again, this is the Redstock website under data sets. We'll be clicking uh, by state under the data viewer links. Houston, my husband's from Texas, so I better believe I understand what Texas is. So we pulled up Texas mm -hmm. now, and we will explore our bar charts. So you were interested. Now, forgive me, is Houston also a county or is it just a city? Uh, the county is Harris. Harris. So Houston is a city within. Okay. Yeah. But I'm officially working with the county office, so... So I'm okay. looking at the entire county, but Houston, uh, because it's the city, unless you want to do it a county, I would oh. like to know the the more the most granular of your data. That's what I would like to do because we are doing uh, we're working in the sustainability office, which is what I'm embedded with four different precincts, basically different regions within the county. Mm -hmm. And within those are like smaller, you know, obviously like zip codes and such. So one of my interests are to do analysis for the different precincts if possible. But if sure. that's possible, even whatever the most granular data is available, that will be helpful to me. Yes. Great question. 
So I would say the most granular level you can get to is a Puma, which I believe uh, Phil's already mentioned in the in the chat. So I will say, however, to make sure, because you're my validation lady, um, we <laughs> want to make sure that the data, there's enough samples that you can pull from to know that your results are accurate. And so while you can filter down to one Puma, we recommend that you actually filter down to four or more to make sure oh. you have our kind of minimum required number of samples, which is about a thousand. So the smallest level you can get down to is one Puma, but we recommend looking at them at, at four or more. Okay. So to continue with our example, we can look right. at Houston, the Texas TX. Houston, okay. Yep, it, it exists because I did that. <laughs> I did okay. something last night with that. Uh -huh. But, and what are you interested in looking at? So, you know, I started with the, the basic uh, improvements, but if there's, uh, you know, like the heat pumps will be nice to see mm -hmm. whether that will and the enhancing closure. So can okay. we do like a company? I did enhance a closure last night, but it will be nice to do a combination just to see how that improves. Sure. So if you're interested in a combination, the combinations that we can look at at the Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. So we have to use kind of a predefined combination, um, which in this case, for this data set, um, is kind of a whole home electrification with also looking at um, an envelope package. So either Yeah, thinking... let's start that one. Just the yeah. basic enclosure plus the electrification. Okay. And efficiency. Uh -huh. Yeah. And let's go ahead and click because our results are out of date. And if it's taking a while to load, this is very normal. It's a lot of data. And it's amazing. Look at all of these great savings you can see in down in Texas. Or even at the precinct level, you know, if you, um, I'm not terribly familiar with the formal definition of a precinct, but I understand it's a smaller region. Um, so right. you can do this with at least four Pumas. That's what we would recommend. And we see um, quite a number of savings among many end uses, I think. Oh, see, sometimes you have to guess what the color is showing you. So I had a little bit of trouble yesterday. I thought it was just my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, it's not your age. Uh, I have this as well. So um, sometimes you have to take an informed estimate. Like, for example, it's hot Houston. So I'm going to guess that this pink color. Um, you know what would be nice? If it was when you click onto the elect, like by night, right now, your cursor is on electricity cooling, that the bar kind of gets highlighted as well. If you guys can do that, you know, put put those computer scientists to task. <laughs> yes, we're always uh, always looking for ways to improve. So I appreciate you pointing that out. That would be a helpful feature, I agree with you. Um, so we can see quite a lot of savings here, um, electricity from cooling. And then also looking at this, we have kind of teal color, which I'm gonna get, no, it's not it. Ah. Natural gas heating. The natural gas heating, I think, yeah. Yep, that's another big area. You can see some savings. We also have this nice like fuchsia pink color, which I'm gonna guess is electricity heating. Um, so there you go. And let's just for fun, you because you also said you were interested in, you said you looked at enhanced enclosure last night. Is that what you mentioned? Yes, I did the enhanced enclosure as okay. one practice. Okay, let's just look at it for the whole group just for fun. Mm -hmm. I always think enclosure yeah. measures are so helpful because if you do them first before your other sizing, you can actually size your other system smaller. So I personally love enclosures myself. That, because then you can see the differential. I mean, are you mm -hmm. uh, really making a big difference or if that's sufficient? I mean, sometimes it's, you know, diminishing returns. And that's how you go back to the, the people. We really want to push for something. Let's start with the, the biggest bang for your buck. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so similar, we have similar colors here were shown, so we can see a lot of savings from uh, electricity cooling. We have our nice teal color, which is natural gas heating. Sorry to interject about enclosures real quick. I haven't read all the technical documents, but do you guys take into account like um, infiltration rates yes. and everything as well as part of like airtight? Okay. Yeah. Yes. And let's look at this together. So this is the technical documentation link that I put in the chat. 
So for example, let's just look at the details for our measure package one, which is the basement closure. So you can see in our summary here, um, we model a 30% reduction in ACH 50 um, for dwelling units with greater than 10 ACH 50. And if we scroll down to the details about our enhanced enclosure package, I believe. So it's everything in package one. So we model uh -huh. that 30% reduction in addition to other things as well. So yes, um, it's all in the documentation. Grab a cup of coffee and sit down one day and look through it. It's really <laughs> I thought I'd so, take the easy way out initially. Well, thank you. <laughs> I will sit so, down and look through it. One question, guys. Um, you mentioned that, you know, just right now when you went to that detail coverage, is that 30% improvement, and then the additional thing brings another incremental uh, improvement, but they're not uh, just straight additions, right? Because you said that some cases there may be some uh, discrepancies, so therefore the number is not a straight A plus B. If you're looking at the interactions between the packages? Right. Yes. You're correct. It's Excellent. not just A plus B. Um, we do look at how different systems interact together. Excellent. Yes. I just wanted to double check that. Sure. Thank you. So I think um, we have enough time for one more question. Um, if anybody would like to come up and ask that. I see, Phil, you have also been really active. Is there anything that you would like to mention to the group? Yeah. Um, you know, not as exciting to talk about a limitation of our tool, um, but we do not currently model evaporative cooling um, since it doesn't work like like you said, Adam, like a regular air conditioner um, since there's no compressor. Um, so that's a limitation of rest stock. It seems like it's possible um, to model it in like the open studio application we use to create model files. So basically that opens the door that in the future, we might add it and integrate it to rest stock. But like, like you said, it's usually prevalent in colder, dry areas that get kind of warm sometimes, like Southern Colorado or even here in Denver. Um, but not a very populous region. So we try to, you know, we try to focus on more more populous regions with with our with our modeling. So there was there's a bit of triage there. Great. Well, good to know. I appreciate it. Um, I've, I've modeled it before in Open Studio, um, but yeah, if I still love to get more information on, I guess, incorporating the data sets you guys have, you know, into Open Studio. So I, I think you guys had mentioned you might put me in contact or provide the information and resources that I can maybe go down that path. So thanks again. Yes, and I believe. Um, let me check one thing. I believe we might have individual model files if you wanted to manipulate them in Open Studio on your own. Um, Adam, you should come work at NREL. You could do this for us and then share with everybody. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Maybe very first time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I believe we, at least in our future data sets that we're releasing, um, in the next few months, we'll have XML files that basically outline the Open Studio file for each dwelling um, in the data set. So hopefully that could be of use um, for you. Okay. I think um, that's all the time we have for Q&A. Um, Phil and I were very intrigued by all of your questions today. We appreciate you guys were so interactive and you know, as always, our um, I'll put our team's email in the chat. You can always reach out to us by email or look at our website if you have any other questions. Otherwise, um, right now I'm going to hand it back to Julia. Thank you again for your time and interactions today. Yeah, thanks, Jess and Phil. Thanks for being here. Um, so, yeah, with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, as a reminder, this has been recorded and we will share the recording in the slides afterwards. Um, and I'm going to drop into the chat our series YouTube playlist actually. And um, you can see it populate there. And also you will see um, all of our other trainings that we've done in this series. I'm also going to drop a feedback form in the chat. Um, it would be awesome if you could just take a couple minutes to fill that out. 
and um, just let us know uh, what you thought of this training and how we can improve for future trainings. Um, yeah, so with that, thanks to everybody for joining. Um, yeah, and we'll go ahead and end a little early here unless there are any other last pressing questions. Thank you.